In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. This is the third Sunday of the Great Lent, and today's Gospel reading tells of the famous story of the prodigal son. This is a story that we've all read, of course, since uh, our early years of uh, Sunday school, and we read it to, to, uh, every year during this uh, Holy Lent on the third Sunday. The context of which Christ is telling this story, this parable of the prodigal son, appears in the first verses in chapter 15 of today's Gospel and in, in, in the Gospel of Luke where it says, Then all the tax collectors and all the sinners drew near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. There were many who were judgmental and rebuked our Lord Jesus Christ because of the kind of love that he showed to sinners and the teaching and the gentleness with which he dealt with all of them, um, with all those who were impure. So the Lord tells these three parables to them. The following, after he was faced with such uh, harsh, judgmental feelings from the Pharisees, he tells them three parables. The first one is of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then today's parable, the, the, the prodigal son, the lost son. All of them pointing to the love and mercy and acceptance of God, which of course is indescribable. His willingness to accept everyone that he he um, that he uh, accepts everyone and even seeks everyone out, even those who have long been astray and have left God willingly, uh, is shown in these three parables. The parables don't just point to those who are on the outside of the church who we want them to come, of course, and and be baptized and be in the church, but it also points to sinners inside the church because when we look at the three parables, it doesn't apply to those who are outside. The coin that was lost was among the ten. The the sheep were in the flock, and the son who, who we read about today was in the father's house. Um, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is what he says. But when we look at the story today of the prodigal son, we see three important characters. The fallen son, the father, and the brother. Um, so let's go through each one separately. The fallen son had both positive and negative uh, characteristics. Let's go through the negative ones first. He wasn't a stranger. He wasn't um, somebody who was like a peripheral, but he was the actual son of the father who lived there. He was he was enjoying the riches of the father. Uh, he was well pleasing to the father. Um, he was free and well bred. You know, he was reduced, however, because of his sins and because he wanted to leave, he was reduced to a very miserable condition and that of maybe even worse than household slaves and strangers and hirelings. And in this imagination and pride that he had, he believed that he could have something better than what he had in his father's house. Uh, he plunged into no ordinary type of sin, he, um, but went to even an extreme to, of evil. He, he kind of departed his father's house and then went and spent his money on harlots and spent his money in a, like partying all the time and then uh, ran out. And, and really that kind of lifestyle have, have led him to a very bad situation. Last week's reading, as we as we talked last week, that all of these readings during Holy Lent are kind of linked together in a spiritual journey. Last week's discussion focused on how Satan and, and the evil world um, has influenced uh, the world and it aims to have us trade what is glorious to what is inferior, what is superior to that we already have to what is inferior that he offers. Uh, and not just inferior, but grossly inferior. He, of course, is jealous of these gifts because he can never obtain them, right? He, we talked about how Satan can never obtain these glorious things that we have. So he deceives us into thinking that these things on the outside are better than what we have on the inside. Uh, the same thing happened to Adam and Eve when that little trick that he played on them and said, you will be like God if you eat of this tree. Were they already like God? Of course, they were already like God, and they would have maintained to be just like God and His created in His image if they did not sin against God. But that was the deception that they fell into. They traded what was noble to what was corrupt because of the deception. He tempted Christ the same way as we talked about last week, our second Adam, and using the same techniques, you know, he was tempting Christ our Lord with things that were grossly inferior to things he already had. But thank God on our behalf, our Lord Jesus Christ was victorious. We're constantly faced with that same kind of choice and lie. Sin in the form of a desire to fulfill the body, a desire for vainglory, a desire for riches. It leads to, like the deception is that these kind of sins lead to nobility, to fulfillment in our life, 
to happiness. But of course, it's a great lie that Satan sends out into the world, into the system of the world. And it's a doctrine of lies that we have to be on guard against. Today we read about how the prodigal son was deceived with this, right? And with with what he, the world offered uh, him, he thought, hey, this could be much better. So he went out into the world and he thought that he could have something better than what his father offered. He took this inheritance that God, um, that his father gave him and squandered it and didn't find mercy or love outside of the home after his money was spent. And the parable shows that it leads to misery and to slavery and poverty. He was forced to not only be like a slave but he was a slave of the of the swine of the pigs because he was like serving the pigs and feeding the pigs but the prodigal son didn't despair that was one of the positive qualities that he had and we always kind of beat up on the prodigal son but one of the really good qualities he had was that he didn't despair but allowed him, and you know he allowed his condition to awaken his conscience and come to his senses and so he didn't reside in his situation for long but he got up and he went back to his father because to have fallen is not as bad as to remain fallen and not get back up again. To have fallen is not as bad as to remain fallen and not get back up again. That's what St. John Chrysostom says. Not getting back up due to maybe laziness or cowardliness or lack of faith or despair. Despair is one of the tools that Satan, of course, uses. But it also covers up a lack of moral purpose in our own life. And we use despair as an excuse to not uh, to not step in and to return back to God. The devil, of course, wants us to always de embrace despair until our soul perishes. Scripture constantly, though, reassures us that God wants to accept us and not just slightly desires it, but deeply is passionate about us to return and that we should never despair. I'll mention just a few verses just so we know uh, and are reassured of this, this uh, fact. It says in uh, Jeremiah, Moreover, you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Will they not fall and rise, and not one turn away and not return? Why has this people slid him back, Jerusalem, in a perpetual or continuous backsliding? Backsliding. They have hold fast and embraced deceit. They refuse to return. And in Malachi it says, Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. And that's what we should say to our enemy when we fall. When he tempts us with despair, do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. In Proverbs, it says, a righteous man may fall seven times a day and rise again. Seven, of course, is a symbol of fullness, a full number of times a day, but will rise again. And that that's what defines a righteous man. Not that they don't sin, but because when they sin, they get back up again and they trust in God's love and mercy and is faithful in his acceptance. In Ezekiel it says, For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. He wants us to live. He wants us to repent. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah. And in Proverbs it says, Turn up my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Turn up my rebuke. Sometimes we, um, when God sends us friendly reminders, these whales that swallow us, right? Like with Jonah, we have to respond to these things and to let it kind of prick our conscience and to repent and to return to God because that's what he really wants. He doesn't want us to live in these miseries, but he wants us to awaken and return to him. And this is what the prodigal son did, similar to what Jonah the prophet did. He felt the rebuke while he was in the well. It took him three days, of course, to be inside the well before he came to himself. But eventually he did come to himself and he prayed and God had mercy on him and, and spit him back on the shore. In Galatians chapter 4, it says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Because God is our father, just like in today's story. We are like that prodigal son. No matter where we are in our spiritual life, we're returning to him and God accepts us. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So when we stumble, we need to remember that he is our father and that he accepts us in his loving embrace like we read in the beautiful story today and honors us with the and clothes us with his righteousness. So that's the son. Let's now turn our attention to the love of the father. 
He is full of love, gentleness, and joy at the return of his son. He accepts the son like a great doctor, like a, like a physician, right? He brings him back into a state of health. He wasn't healthy before, but because of the medicine that he applied to him, the spiritual medicine, uh, he became healthy again. He didn't deal with the prodigal son with great severity. You can imagine that the father could have said, you know, like we were talking yesterday in our Sunday school class, you know, you know, hey, I told you so, you know, you, you squandered half of my wealth. Uh, don't return back here until you, you know, go back and make that money and, and, and return it here. He didn't bring up money at all. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he wasn't severe with his son at all. He was very, very gentle and forgiving. Um, what the father cared about is that that separation between the son and him is not prolonged. He didn't want that that separation to be far and long. And we we see that image of, you know, that famous uh, painting where we have Christ carrying the sheep on his shoulder. Uh, this is exactly what we see today. He desires all men to be saved. Um, and as he says in Malachi again, return to me and I will return to you. We see how in the story of the prodigal son represents the impact of sin in our lives to its fullest measure. And when it has become habitual and has fully taking control of our lives, it brings us to a really sad state. But at the same time, um, you know, we see God's love in all this. Sin has weighed us down to such a degree that we become worse than the pigs. We become even the, the servant of the pigs. Um, but sin brought him to his knees among the mud and filth of, the, of those pigs. But we see again the love of the Father. When Even here, when Christ entered into the scene, he raises him up and restores him to his sibling and to his household. He says, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. So let's go through these tokens that he does here. Uh, he orders the robe to be brought to him and which is like a, a wedding garment, uh, a robe uh, like when we if you've attended a wedding, we see the priest. He puts on the robe on the, the female and the male. They look very majestic and, and glorified. Right. And the priest prays on these robes, uh, very sublime words. He says, may these robes be robes of glory, of salvation, of joy and gladness. So he clothes us uh, with robes of glory salvation joy and gladness can you imagine this this young uh this prodigal son coming back after the disaster that he suffered at his own hands and god and his father clothes him with glory clothes him with salvation with joy and with gladness compared to what he had just a, just a few minutes before that he puts a ring on his finger which is of course the seal of the holy spirit that he gives to all of the believers uh, after we are baptized. He puts sandals on his feet and runs out to him so that his journey, his repentance, his return to him is not prolonged and it's not difficult. And so he wants to shorten that, that distance between us. He wants to make the journey to himself as comfortable as possible. He puts sandals on his feet and he runs out to him and meets him and kisses him on the neck. Then having received that forgiveness and, and the reassurance, um, the father kills the fatted lamb. The, the lamb, he allows it to be killed and uh, to feast on the lamb, having received the forgiveness of sin. Now, after this reassurance, he receives now the worthiness to eat of the lamb. And this is us as well. When we are receiving the forgiveness of our sins, now we, we come to the Lamb who was sacrificed on behalf of the world, who takes away the sins of the whole world. We now come to Him as He forgives us and accepts us. He prays, you know, He tells us, Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. A very contrite attitude, which is the right attitude to have. But the Father did not allow that to be the case. He did not uh, allow him to be a servant. He did not allow that. He restored his sonship back to the father and, and brought him back uh, to his former state. So this is how our Lord deals with uh, the situation. There is no failure that our ever victorious Lord Jesus Christ, whenever he's present, there is no failure. He, when he is invited to take charge, everything is transformed. Even when sin has completely brought us down to our knees, to utter shame, God still lifts us back up again. He'll bring victory in the same place where there was previously a defeat. 
He will restore us to our siblings. Of course, who are our siblings? The angels, the prophets, the saints, the martyrs, the fathers who have been making deep supplication for us, asking for our return, praying for our return. And unlike that jealous brother in today's story, these siblings of ours are you know the saints and the martyrs and the prophets and the angels they pray and rejoice at our return and pray for our return uh, through through deep intercessions we may have seen it with our own eyes we see people returning and repenting these are miracles that are happening before our very eyes when we see that the lord is moving within the hearts of the believers to return them uh, to uh, to Christ, even those who are completely habituated in sin, and they be turn and they become like angels because of the loving embrace of our Lord Jesus Christ and acceptance that he offers to everyone. Then we look at the brother, uh, the brother who uh, was there and did not ask for half of the inheritance, and he did not go out into the world and have it squandered. But he didn't have the same mind of the father. He didn't have that same mind regarding his brother that his father had. He cared more about the material gain and honor than the salvation of his brother. In the church, we should always keep God's mission in our mind, which is basically the, the salvation of everyone around us, not just here in our church, which of course we should all care about, and we all have that responsibility, but also outside the church as well. We, we should have some level of care and some level of concern about the salvation of those who are outside of our church, as well as those who are inside of our church. We should have that same mind, because when we do have that same mind, it puts us in line with all the prophets and all the saints of old, um, even when they didn't want to at first, like Jonah the prophet, but in the end, you know, they, even he returned. This is the mind of God. When when we read uh, before the Holy Lent fast, we of course read uh, the, during Jonah's fast, that um, Jonah resisted God. He didn't have that same mind as God, just like the brother in today's story. And he was so angry with God that he accepted the Ninevites that he said, it's right for me to be angry even unto death. And then he said, but the heavens, you know, the heavens rejoiced in the salvation of 120,000 Ninevites. But Jonah, who was a prophet, should have had that same mind as God, but he didn't. He was really upset even unto death. That, um, that these people were saved. And God, God gently rebukes him and educates him. God requires um, even of those who are thoroughly steadfast in the faith, in the Christian life, living holy, with firm in their faith, that they should still be zealous and earnest about following his will with regard to the salvation of those around him, especially when it relates to the repentance of others. That they should be having the same mind of Christ, that mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? The mind of Christ is to rejoice at the return of others and to labor in the return of others. Even if they're very highly blameful, we are to seek them out and to make um, and to be very happy when they return, to have that kind of a mind. And not to be jealous or judgmental and and object because God has called them back. How dare we reject what God has called back. And this is what the Pharisees did, and this is the reason why our Lord Jesus Christ gave this parable to them. Um, we say of the, in the litany of the sick that he is the hope of us all. He is the hope of those who have no hope, the help of those who have no help, the comfort of the faint-hearted, the harbor of those in the storm. So we should have this same mind and accept uh, those who come to our church and those who want to come to salvation. God forbid we are like the Pharisees who actually have with a judgmental eye rebuke those who come back we should not be judgmental because of course we stand by the mercy of god if we do stand so let's close today with with what saint cyril of alexandria says he says it is our duty to bend ourselves to god's will if he heals those who are sick he raises those who are fallen he gives a help a helping hand to those who have stumbled. He brings back him who has wandered. He forms anew a praiseworthy and blameless life, those who were in the depth of sin. He seeks those who were lost. He raises, as from the dead, those who have suffered the spiritual death. Let us re also rejoice. Let us, in the company of the holy angels, praise him as being good and loving, as gentle and not remembering evil. For if such is our state of mind, Christ will receive us. To whom be glory forever. Amen.